Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sunday Learnings with me, Ben Ibrahim. Thank you so much for watching my previous episodes. It's been a real, real pleasure connecting with you all. Please click the like, subscribe, or follow button if you haven't done so already. Our topic today is how to win Olympic gold. And two very decorated Olympic coaches have given up their time to be with us here today, Mr. Noel Donaldson and Paul Thompson. Paul Thompson is the head rowing coach of the Chinese Rowing Association, and Noel Donaldson, the head coach of the Victorian Institute of Sport. Tomo coached the women's four at the Barcelona Olympics in 1992, and then in 1996 with Kate Slater and Megan Still, now Megan Marks and Kate Allen, won the women's coxless pair and the gold medal at the Atlanta Olympics, and then four years later at Sydney, Rachel Taylor and Kate Allen, Kate Slater, won a silver medal. Because he was so successful, he was headhunted to British rowing, and he was the head women's coach and later on promoted to chief lightweight coach. And he won five Olympic gold medals spanning the 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016 Olympic Games and other silver and bronze medals as well and multiple world championships. So very lucky to have Tomo in our neck of the, well, on our neck of the woods, Zoom-wise. And then we've got Noel Donaldson, aka Don, the Zen of Noel Donaldson, as many people always say. The founder of the awesome foursome, coach of the awesome foursome to the 92 and 96 Olympic gold medals back to back. Barcelona 92, Atlanta 96. Co uh, coach Matt, he used to be a Cox, coach Matt Long and James Tompkins to a bronze medal at the Sydney 2000 Olympic and the men's pair. And then in the 2004 and the 2012 Olympic quadrennium was the men's head coach and led them to multiple medals as well. 2008, high performance director at the uh, Beijing Olympic Games. And because he's so good, he went to across the Tasman to New Zealand, where he led Eric Murray and Hamish Bond to an Olympic gold medal. Not just an Olympic gold medal, but for four years, they were undefeated. And one thing about Don, he will always say, oh, I was always lucky, very humble. He had great athletes. But Don and Tomo, two fantastic coaches, and they know how to win Olympic gold. So gentlemen, let's get stuck into it. Tomo, I'll start with you. In terms of a journey of wanting to win an Olympic gold medal, Where's a good starting point? Um, well, at the start point is, uh, uh, and it'll always be at the end of one Olympics and starting for, for another. And, uh, you know, in our, in our sport, performance improves by about half a percent over the four, the four year cycle. So the, the trick is predicting how fast you need to be and what you need to do to do that. And looking at your athletes and looking at where your strengths and where your your weaknesses are, where your shortcomings are, what you can address, what are those big things you can do, uh, prioritizing those and, and you know, making uh, the athletes that you've, that you've got because the gold medals only come to a very, very few, few of them. And uh, so you, you have a bit of a, a, a roadmap to, to, to follow if you, if, if you like. And, and then in, in our sport, like, like most others, the, the quality of your and consistency of your training um, is going to give you the, the level at which you're going to race. You're going to step off and, and race. So the more gold medal quality strokes you have in training every day, the more opportunity you've got to, to, be, in that, to be in that race. Because, of course, you have to deliver a performance at a given point in time, once every four years. And so your your training environment needs to needs to reflect uh, reflect that. So, you know you have to be working with your athletes and be able to to show the vision and show the mission and show the show the passion to uh, to to the way to the way forward. There, there could be many starting points. You know some of that circumstantial. Uh, Tom is exactly right. You know once you get in the Olympic cycle, it certainly rolls in four-year cycle and that's how you think about it but the very beginning of the journey for some coaches you know who haven't been to an olympics or haven't coached on olympic cycle there too you know the, the entry point can be completely different and it certainly was for me you know i got um called back because some experienced coaches good mates of tomo's and mine were headhunted to go overseas and the last bloke left was me you know so i had my hand up you know getting off the train and um yeah, so you mentioned before about, you know, humility or, you know, you give credit to the athletes uh, you know, more so than the coaches. But certainly in that situation, you know, I, my job was to really make and create and put something together that hadn't been done before. But 
it certainly wasn't my idea right from the very beginning and it was very collective so um, yeah I think to answer your question a little bit the start it's the, the start point is different from the midpoint you know and, and the end point is different as well too you know because I've effectively happily finished an Olympic campaign of coaching seven Olympic Games uh, and I'm working now uh, back in my home state where I was many years ago doing some developmental work and the the day-to-day -day or the challenges of coaching athletes and the like doesn't actually change that much and you know, Tomo's right in terms of if we can get enough training into them and we get the best people in the right boats and we know what we're actually targeting for, then you're going to end up, you know, having some success, you know, if, if those ingredients are good enough, you know, in the field that you're against. So in one sense, I think there's a lot of changes in world rowing, but the basic ingredients in terms of the coaching and needing to do the work, uh, you know, that hasn't changed. And sometimes you've got to come about how you do the work, and I'm sure you'll flush some of that out during uh, this interview because I've read the questions, you know, so I'm a little bit ahead of uh, what we're actually going to talk about here. The uncontrollable factors of an Olympic journey. I mean, coaches plan the details out of it, but something always happens that you can't predict. Um, tell us about the uncontrollable factors that has happened in your journey or journeys, and maybe something that you're quite proud of in how you mitigated it. To your question, I was thinking, and, and Noel and I shared this one as well, was the night before our Olympic finals, or the, the Rowers Olympic finals, in 96. In 96, okay. We had a specific bomb threat against the Australian team. And it was early in the morning. So we had races going from nine o'clock. They were early morning, early morning races. And suddenly we're out in the, the middle of an oval being evacuated um, uh, the night before the Olympic, the Olympic final. And, uh, you know, that, that, that day in racing, we got two golds and a silver, if my memory serves me correctly. And I, and I think it, it just showed how, how good the team was was operating again when you talk about uncontrollables how do you prepare for something something like that other than everybody taking it in their stride having to reassess and and really it was uh it was more of a hiccup than the deal that it really could have been don i'm not certain i've got over that the moment i started the engine of the car they they made us uh, <laughs> gather on the uh, on the oval and and uh and then the uh, police checked under the car with their mirrors and that sort of thing. Then they finally gave us the go ahead. And uh, I'm not overly religious, but I did say a prayer when I turned the ignition just to make sure it wasn't going to go kaboomba. And uh, off we went for our Olympic journey and a couple of hours earlier than was expected. And we used the time wisely. And, 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 and in probably tell, retelling all the stories of the success of that crew, that certainly comes out in terms of the stories. And even uh, the anniversary of it was only a few weeks ago. And some of the social media correspondence back with the gang and all that sort of stuff uh, reflected on the day and, 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 and the bomb scare and all of those sort of things there too. So lives with you forever. But, um, yeah, we, we've had our challenges, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a matter of coming out the better end of it. So I had one. Uh, so, um, and uh, there was still racing going on on the Sunday for the second day of final. And, and we wanted to keep it, keep it quiet from the, from the press and all the rest of it because we didn't want to cause trouble for the crews that, that were racing racing there and Kate and Megan had gone and done this stuff and you come back in in the victory ceremony and you get in and you do your press press uh, um, press conference and uh, I think it was the Sydney Morning Herald guy uh, Alex was talking to me and he said uh, so uh, Tom you had to get out of bed early this morning did you and uh, oh no more early than usual you know all that, that sort of stuff and he, he let me go on and on and on and uh, then um, then he came back and he said, come on, we, we, we know about that. And, uh, but I'll come back to my first question. You had to get out of bed early, didn't you? And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, well, look at your feet. Because I had one Adidas shoe on and one Asex shoe in the, in the flurry of getting evacuated. I just grabbed a left and a right one and off we, off we went. Yeah, well, I, I, I can't quite match that one. But the <laughs> photos of uh, the, the, the four there, there was one with me on their shoulders Lucky, you know, not that big a guy, so you can sort of do that, so it's capturing that style of photo. And you can see clearly my pajamas that are hanging out <laughs> underneath my shorts and photo. <clears throat> my sleepwear or whatever you want to call it. In terms of mental health, not just of the athlete, 
but of the coach because you're a head coach. Dono, you're a head coach. So you've got to look up, you've got to coach coaches, which is probably the hardest job in the world to do. In terms of identifying mental health challenges and issues and mitigating them, maybe you can give us some stories, some examples. Being more contemporary than uh, when Noel and I were working to, together way back when. Yeah, well, with the, with the virus, that's affected, you know, sports people and, and really affected sport across the, um, across the world and across the different sports. And, and uh, my Chinese experience is that, you know, it affects them just as much as it affects everybody else. So, you know, like Noel said, he'll have some people training at home. You know, we've had people training in uh, hotel rooms, um, coaching over Zoom. Um, and, and then the delay of the Olympic Games has had a, had a big impact, whether you're from China or Australia, New Zealand, Britain, wherever. Um, you know, some people wanted to move on and have a family. Some people wanted to, to finish up and do other things in your life. And, and of course, you know, the, the people themselves are going to be, be, be unraveling that for themselves. And I think from, from a practical coaching sense, you, you have to be able to identify, you know, you, if you're with the, an athlete every day, you get to know who they are. And, and, and people, you know, performance isn't linear and people aren't linear either. And so if you start to see some different behaviours, the trick for the coach is to know when coaching stops and they need some real professional help and being able to know where to, to flag the person to, where to signpost them to, where to put the hand up. Because sometimes there's, there's things when people get in those states and have those problems, you know, no coaching in the world's going to, going to help them. They really need some other support. And so, so being able to access that medical side of support and be able to do it in a discreet and confidential, uh, confidential way is re really important in this, in this day, day and age. One of the most important things uh, always was, and if you look at the, the phys uh, physical injury, so to speak, it was the, the diagnosis was key. But if we actually think back, I think we, we, you know, we would probably like to um, think we did a reasonable job with the mental health of our athletes back in the day, whereby if there was something not quite right with them, they weren't diagnosed, for example. So there was no title given to something um, and the like. And so the, the mental health issues that we have today uh, are much better diagnosed in terms of what it might actually be and, and how people might perform and react and, and what our things are to, to in terms of a rehab sort of point of view. And, and we need to look to the experts for that, just like we have always looked to a doctor, a physiotherapist or whatever it might be in, in terms of the uh, the physical side of it. So that, that's where the biggest change. Uh, I think life itself is you know, throwing a lot more curveballs and, and that, of course the virus is maybe one of the biggest of them all, certainly in, in, in recent times. And so therefore, it's something we've got to keep our eye on much, much more than what it really is. And the challenge for the coach is, you know, how hard do you remain before you become empathetic or you've handballed something over? It's a very, very difficult thing to do, you know. Um, I, I, I've got a lot of time for the modern athlete. I think they've got significant challenges in their lives, you know, compared to maybe 20, 30 years ago, it was maybe a bit more simple and the like there too. But I... I, I like their attitudes. I like their behaviours. You know, there's not too many of them that necessarily play a mental health card on you. You know, I'm not performing well because, and so therefore that, that's my way out. You know, you could feign an injury or whatever, or just a bit, if you overtrained or you think oh, I'll just pull a hammy for a bit longer for another week and, you know, the coach will go a bit easier on me, whatever. You don't seem to get that with their mental health. So it is reasonably genuine. And so that you've got to take, each case on its merits and you've got to make sure you do the right thing. Sayings in coaching is always coaching, always learning. And like you said, Don, we never stop learning. Can you tell our audience in terms of, I call it the M&M effect, not chocolates, but mistaken milestones. One piece of innovation that you did that led to success and you know, it was a maverick move. And one mistake that you clearly made that probably didn't lead to success, but it made you a better coach. Mind you, I don't think with any of the successful crews, I've made a clanger, you know, I've made lots of clangers overall in my coaching, but maybe not so for the ones there. But the good things, a couple, couple that come to mind, um, certainly were uh, 
with the four because it had a longer period of time. The, 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 the four, the four, yeah, um, we changed the seating in it, you know, regularly. Now, whether that's innovation or that's just something you felt that you needed to actually do, to me, that was all, we were always looking for an edge. We were always looking for something new, something different. So, you know, I don't think we ever thought that we just put the same outfit out there again and because we're winning, we'll, we'll go and win again, you know. So you're looking things. So it was musical chess, for want of a better word, and, and um, it kept it fresh, it kept it vital, it gave people roles to play, new things to learn, etc. So I would have, maybe that's not innovation necessarily, but it's one thing that you hold your hat on for something that ended up being quite successful over a reasonable period of time. But certainly with the Kiwi pair, on a physical uh, point of view, you know, from the training they'd done for four years before where they hadn't lost a race, to, to the second four years where I coached them, to uh, not lose a race as well. So we actually changed the training around reasonably significantly um, to keep them fresh and to try and work on some areas where could have been their Achilles heel in terms of being beaten. You know, if someone had a, been able to go fast enough and get far enough in front of them and they might have been able to mow them down. So we were very aware of that and, and, and pacing our race structures. And, uh, and, and that, but that was a collective, you know. So when you innovate something, normally you need people to help be part of that journey with you. And, you know, when you take quality sports scientists and people like that who you trust on that journey, um, who can unravel sort of your ideas and your concepts, and I think that's far more effective than not. You know? uh, the clangers I've made have been more more in my management style and skill, actually, too. You know, I, I talk about that of um, uh, in the 2012 Olympic 8, you know, when I was co-coaching with... Uh, Curtis Jordan, one of my great mates, and the like there too. And and I think we've recognised that we hadn't coached before, but we weren't able to work that partnership the best way it actually should have been. And I, and I actually should have put my foot down about how we got that structure right, and I didn't. At the end of the day, that those athletes came six in the Olympic Games, and I think we had more in us than that, you know. So I think that's a mistake by just not speaking up and saying what was really on my mind. You know, I was almost like. They thought I was the bad cop, but I ended up being probably too nice a guy in terms of what the end outcome needed to actually be. Uh, and the other one was when I became high performance director, I, I was given a caveat uh, for doing it by the board in terms of needing to have an international consultant working with us. You know, that was if you are to be a young boss, as I was at the time, then we need an older uh, person alongside you and we'll do a review and we'll do all of these things. And of course, was a great opportunity for me, so I just nodded my head and went along with it there too. But I actually should have told them to put it somewhere where it mightn't have liked to be fitted. And uh, you know, you either trust me and get on with the job or, or not. So, because in that situation, I was a leader, but I wasn't leading, so to speak. You know, and um, you know, as a result of that, we we did some reasonable things, but not necessarily. Um, uh, did we do all the things that we probably could have done there too? If, if you're not inquisitive and really curious as a coach, well, then you, you're going to be very short-lived in the in, in the game. So, so there's been been lots of, of things trying to to give different feedback or giving live feedback to the to the athletes in in, in different ways. I, I still find um, um, live gog using goggles to give instant video feedback, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I was very fortunate enough to get on this uh, UK sport program called Elite Program, and they gave us money to develop stuff. So I got a first principle model by a Oxford University professor, uh, developed of rowing, and, and you, can, you can use that in many ways, but it led to the redevelopment of the um, biomechanics system. And, and what I really wanted to get to was, was training rowers by power. And, and um, because all the stuff that we do with stopwatches and all the rest of it, we, um, we uh, um, you take the, the boat as a total, but you can't see what the individuals are actually doing in, in between and what their contribution to it, to it is. And, and um, was able to use it to, and this is, in, this is not a gold medal winning crew, but took a, a, young, a very young crew in, in, in 2017 and, and ended up in, in, a, in a medal situation there. And part of the learning was how, how well you can use that, that, that instant feedback, that power feedback, because you can use it for your power and increasing that, but you can also use it for efficiency as, as well. So 
using that that an, an innovative uh, approach and using the technology that was was available to us because they had live feedback of that in the in the boat uh, and then you don't want to use that too much you don't want to get paralysis by analysis either so so being able to to do that um, was was again where where you get a result or some some a good result at the end of it with new with new athletes after an Olympic year um, I was uh, I was quite quite proud of, proud of that and for the clangers yeah of course there's there's been lots of those um you know the Noel describes the the modern athlete and if you don't stay connected and relevant to to young people well then you lose your relevance as your your coach um i've definitely grown more reflective as of as i've got over of my own performance and and of course coaching is a performance a performance as well um, some of the decisions on the uh, on the way through, I, I think one of the one of the hard things of being uh, a, a head coach, and I, and I must say, with with all the success that the teams had, that's not me as a head coach. Uh, they've had fabulous rowers and fantastic coaches to to work with. Because if you're the head coach, you you want to push success further than just you. Because if it's just about you, then you're not going to get get the success you get. But um, Noel mentioned about not having good enough athletes. No, sorry, only having a few athletes at the very top that that we need. And the pressure, the pressure on the head coach is you want to qualify all the boats and you want to win lots of medals. And if often you have to reach so far down in the development path to to get some talented athletes up that they're still not ready to make it to the top to the top level. So there's a danger that that you can bring people in too soon, and I, I feel I've probably made a, uh, made a little bit of that. I'm going to ask you a super tough question, but that's why I sent you the questions earlier. Tomo, six Olympic goals, I think, um, including the race with Kate and Megan in 1996. Uh, Dono, three Olympic goals. I think it was with one with the Kiwi pair, two with Wilson Forsum. I mean, as yourself, as the actual crew coach. I mean, which one stands out as your favorite? Not so much about the result, but the drama that you had to go through to get that result. It is difficult because every campaign has its ups and downs. Um, and I think we'll, we'll later on, we'll reflect on the 96 result. The 96 result probably would be a little bit of that, you know, in terms of, you know, we talked earlier about the actual games experience and everything as well too. But um, that one went right down to the wire in terms of, um, you know, the, the drama associated with it, you know. So we changed the crew around. We, you know, James Lompkins had straight the boat mainly, but Mike Mackay came in and and he had a moment of doubt a few weeks beforehand. You know, he, he was fearful that, um, you know, he was my, maybe only um, babysitting that seat. And so he had a conversation with me and reassured him that, no, no, he was the man for the job. And you know, he would take that boat through and he would lead that boat through to Atlanta and just needed that reassurance and, and the like. And, of course, you know, we'd, we'd race the year before and come fifth. Um, as they say in the Classic, it was a bloody good fifth um, because we were quite close in the semi-final and we'd had to go through a uh, ripper charge as well. So we were, we were near, you know, we were just behind the eventual gold and silver medalists in the semi. So fifth wasn't too bad. We just ran out of gas. And if we trained well, you know, we were going to be... Uh, in the hunt, but we lost a crew member. You know, we lost uh, Andrew Cooper, who would obviously been in a winning boat in 92, and we picked up a young guy, Andrew Ginn, who becomes a household now, name now in rowing, but that was his first um, hurrah into the into the big time. But, you know, he, he, he went along really nicely in that there too. But, you know, you're still teaching someone, you know, how to perform on the big stage, you know, with limited experience and... and um, so that becomes a bit of a challenge. But actually, at the event itself, other than the uh, the bomb threat there too, we we set ourselves a goal, as all crews will. You know, you'll set yourselves targets or you'll, you'll be forever measuring yourselves and can you achieve it and whatever. And one of the key targets for that particular crew was to win every race and to be the dominant crew in every event. So you go into the final, having rode the fastest seat, the fastest semi, and, you know, you're basically you know, done the job and if you execute it well in the final, you'll win. But that didn't necessarily happen. You know, we'd won our heat, but in our semi-final, we came third. But not much unlike the year before. It was only bit, bit, bit between um, 
what was in the end the eventual second and third place getters. So we weren't in a bad position and yet we hadn't executed that race as well as we could. But um, that uh, the, the, straight after the race, and it shows you how athletes, you know, how, when, when they're really on a fine line, Olympic Games, you've got media responsibilities and corporate responsibilities and you want to see your loved ones and your parents in the kiss and cry zone. And there's all these things to manage. And um, the loss there actually got to those guys a bit and they didn't necessarily follow what we'd set in place, you know. We had it in place, you know, the recovery and the ice bars and the, and the meals and what we were doing and who was doing media and all these things. And all of those things went out the window. They lost their way quite a bit because they got beaten you know, through them a little bit. So I stepped into the middle of a media interview and just almost made a gig of myself and, uh, and I just said, have you uh, had, had your lunch yet? This is in the middle of one of their media interviews. They said, no, no, I haven't. It's off you go, go to have lunch. I, I basically just halted the entire interview um, to, to try and get things back on track a bit. That was what I actually thought. And um, anyway, later on, we got in the car to go home there and I thought this is going to be an interesting ride home. <laughs> I thought they might attack me a bit because I'd been into them a little bit. And one of them spoke up and actually said, you were right, we lost our way, you know, we need to pull our heads in and, and get on with the job. And that in one sense was the, the cornerstone to being able to then get the next two days or so until the final in the right order because they were captive. Luckily, as history goes, you know, we made what I would have thought some, some good calls, you know, we, we got back and I outlined to them, I said, I want you to have the night off. We're not going to debrief now. You know, you need some mental recovery time and enjoy yourselves, whatever. But that was really because I knew no idea what I was going to do and I needed to buy time for myself, um, which included talking to Jeff Bond, a sports psychologist, and Ryan Albachi, our head coach. We went into town, had a coffee. We wrote down, should we do this, should we do that? And should Ryan hold to us? A gruff Romanian who Tom and I love dearly, you know, shall I kick them up the behind and tell them to get on with it? Or, yeah, we wrote that down, maybe we do that. And in the end, we came up with a plan that we thought was going to work. And then, and, and we had a meeting at nine o'clock the next morning. And that meeting becomes a little bit legendary in terms of that particular event there too, you know, how we called it and the talk about the unity and working together. And so I demonstrated magnets together or magnets apart. and demonstrated a funnel with their egos, um, you know, all coming into the one central point and therefore we've got a shitload of ego, ego all working in the right direction. There's a whole heap of sort of anecdotal type sort of stuff there that was really powerful in terms of them getting on the one page. And um, our massage therapist was a great bloke, Luke Atwell, and he worked with them. And he doesn't drink a lot of beer, Luke, necessarily, but he, um, he came to my room about nine o'clock at night, he'd given the boys a massage that night, the night before, and uh, and he came, he said, let's go and have a beer. I said, oh, okay, that's unusual for you. And he said, you're going to win. <laughs> and I thought, the race is tomorrow, you know, not now, whatever. And he said, yeah, yeah, they're, they're in really good space. And and um, Mike McKay will tell the story. He went back that night after the massage and wrote in his book, in his diary, we'll win, no, no doubt, you know, sort of thing. So, you know, you don't know that at the time necessarily, but when you look back on it and you find out those sort of things there too, through the dramas and the loss and all, you know, all those sort of things there, the good comes out of it as well. And we're in lane six, which was this uh, portable pontoon that only the American uh, military could actually make that housed the majority of the, the grandstand. And, and we we're in that lane and, Kieran Perkins, a great Olympic swimmer, he was in the outside lane the night before and he'd won as well too. So, you know, we were drawing comparisons there too that fate put us in that outside lane so the crowd could cheer for us and no one else. And Kieran had done it, so why can't we do it, you know? So there's a story to be told sort of thing there too. Now, whether any of it mattered or not, who would know uh, necessarily, but um, it may have had, all of those things may have had some sort of an impact on the end result because they certainly rode to plan that next day, you know, bang on in every particular way. So you've got more to select from and it's a tough one. Which one would you select, Tom? The London experience as both a, both a head coach and a, and a crew coach was, was absolutely fabulous. And I, 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 the, the atmosphere there of 30,000 pe uh, people the, the Dawny Roar, as it was called, you're, you're riding your bike on the towpath in front of the, the, um, the crowd and, you know, they're doing little Mexican waves to the, to the coaches going up to the line. It was, uh, it was a real cauldron and a real atmosphere. And, and for being inside the team, um, 
you know, we 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 had uh, with with Catherine and Anna, they could they couldn't get from the entry to the boat park without getting mobbed. I, I've never seen anything like it in 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 rowing before, and and we had some. Uh, some protection security from from the Metropolitan Police there. Actually, it was uh, the Prime Minister's uh, security guard to to make make the way through the through the crowd. So it was it was very much a different a different cauldron and a different environment to be in. And if I just come back to to, to the bit about the the um, the consistency and the level that you train at. Uh, three weeks before, uh, two weeks before the, the game, we do a 2,000 metres and, and we had three crews better the world's best time and two other crews were pretty close to it. So I was quite quite confident that we'd be able to to get get some very, very good results if we could get manage the games, manage the expectations, manage the rowers to get there. And um, as it transpired, we, we got three gold medals with them, including Catherine and Anna that, that, that I coached. But importantly for, for, for rowing, um, the, the organising committee always have one, the home team. A successful home games is a successful home team. And uh, uh, Britain weren't winning any gold medals. And it went for the first week. And it came down to rowing. And of course, Britain's first gold medal was a rowing gold medal to, to Helen and uh, Heather. Britain's first gold medal there. So I, I'm quite proud to have had a a smaller part and be, be head coach of that program to do that. But each of those crews had to, to work out how they, how they wanted to manage that situation. So, so for, for Catherine and Anna that had been undefeated, you know, they knew there was going to be pressure. Catherine had um, the, the silver medals from Sydney, from, from Athens and from, from, Be from Beijing and was going for her, for would she do it? Would it be a, would an atmosphere? And as Noel's mentioned before, every Olympiad, you have to reinvent yourself because you can't just do the same. So the pressure was on for, for her as it was for, for, for Anna. So they knew there was going to be pressure and they wanted to embrace it. They, they, they said, a bit like what Noel said, well, this is all put on for us so that we can, that we can perform. The pair of Glover and Stanning, their approach was, well, the boat doesn't know it's the Olympics, so we're just going to go out there and make it go as fast as we can. And then the, the lightweight women's double won, and they wanted to treat it because we'd had our selection regattas there. We're not going to the Olympics. We're going to be going to a selection regatta. We're going to just close everything down and stay in our bubble. So three different ways of crews making their, making their mentality. But to be able to, to get down and work with the, the level of athletes that, that can go undefeated, that can go to that, is a real, is a real privilege as a, as a coach. And then to be able to, uh, to manage that. And, and 2011 hadn't gone well for us. Uh, we'd won everything. Uh, Anna had a back, a back injury. So we had to have a spare race with Catherine. They still won the World Cup in that, that boat. We had some issues with... Um, uh, at the World Championships that year, um, with some gastro problems that went through the different different teams, we were affected by by that. We were lucky to get into the regatta and and get through with a through with the win. So coming into the 2012 season, we had a, a jigsaw about what was in place, what needed to get in place, what was what had come out of place, and so be able to prioritise that and then build up the confidence on on the way uh, on on the way through. So we had some some very um, difficult conversations about you know I had the knocks on my door going do you reckon we're going fast enough to be able to to get there and then to be able to to put everything together to be able to perform on that day in a way and there was good competition okay the Australians got a silver medal there with Kim Kim Crow in that in that boat um, but to be able to be in a race and just at each marker we're just faster and faster and faster than the opportunity. Just everything went to, everything went to plan. So we couldn't we couldn't have asked for more. And and where I get teased at the end of it, we have quite a good um, previewing process, and then after the race, quite a good reviewing process. So we're in the in the taxi on the way on the way to the BBC uh, media centre to do some uh, some interviews there and all the rest of it. And we had a, a bottle of champagne with the <coughs> media officer in the car and. And we're going through the race about whether we give ourselves 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10. And, 
and uh, on the different parameters that were the, that we used and um, and right through to the end they were up for it and uh, no it was still a bit too tense we could have done a bit more here and we could have done a bit more there so even in even in winning gold medals you can still go a little bit a little bit better how important competitions like the Australian Indoor Rowing Championship is in regards to the development of school leavers rowing and the identification of talented athletes. I mean, people like Kim Brennan did not row at school. Kate Slater did not row at school. Um, you know, so can you tell us about the importance of that and how important that is to continue because, you know, the Australian Indoor Rowing Championships is something that's, I mean, pretty exciting that's coming up in October. We have to accept the sport has changed as well too. You know? And, um, you know, for us to re re remain relevant as a world sport, for us, us to maintain our position, at the Olympic Games, you know, for subsequent Olympic Games and the like, the sport's got to keep moving and looking at other areas. And, you know, we're about to lose, we would think, from the Olympic program, lightweight rowing, but we may get coastal rowing uh, in its place. But uh, indoor rowing has certainly aligned itself along with world rowing visa um, significantly. And so everybody is now too. So it's becoming a very normal thing for us to get more people onto rowing ergometers and into competitions. And so you know, early on, the Australian Indoor Rowing Championship was, wasn't necessarily regarded as like winning an Australian Rowing Championship at the Australian Rowing Championships. As time moves forward and with the upcoming championships too, that's going to change, you know. Great idea and uh, I think, you know, this year will be the best, I'd say, and then it will only get better from then on in. And, and they're a lot of fun and uh, getting the teams working around. And if you get on the Concept2 website as, as one provider, and of course, there's a lot of other agometer manufacturers around as well. Um, you know, you've got all different, different um, distances for, for world records and times and ways you can do things. So you can go from your, your 2000 meter to your relays, to your, to your ultra, uh, ultra endurance. And it's, it's, a, it's something where we can take the sport to people where there's not water close by. And uh, recently, um, we had one in China, uh, an agometer. Uh, it was um, a Chinese sport coming through the pandemic. It got three hours of live t television. And Zhang Liang, uh, the stroke out of the double, the double skull, he did the, the marathon, 42K. And he raced 42 people doing 1,000 metres on an ergo on an ergo next to him and um and then yeah then in the meantime you know there's there's relays going on on 2000 meter racing and that filled three hours of live of live uh live television and uh it was a absolutely fabulous fabulous event done in uh a various and diff, diff, different ways and um you know he ended up breaking a breaking a world record he's an outstanding outstanding athlete and you know he's only 90 two or three kilos and um, you know it was uh, it was it was fabulous to sit, sit there and watch him do it but the whole event itself it was televised um, there was atmosphere it was it was a fabulous thing so we can definitely really do something and still do more with uh, with the indoor rowing nice one les so we're just going to finish up with a bit of a feel good factor i mean you both have coached a list of hall of fame athletes so i'm just going to mention the athletes to you just when i say their name just give give me one or two words that best describes their personality in terms of your experience with them as a coach or how you know of them all right so both of you have to answer when i mention their names so um, don i'll start with oh, Tom, i'll start with you debbie flood debbie flood Oh, she's mad. She's mad in a good way. She just goes 110% at whatever she does. Okay, that's about 10 words there, Tomo, but never mind. Go on. <laughs> oh, Debbie Flood. Yeah. Um, oh, captain of Leander. So she's got some <laughs> stick. So she's got some stick about her if she's going to be yeah, captain of that club there. Yeah, so yeah, very well respected in the world of rowing, Debbie Flood. Okay. Tomo, Nick Green. Nick Green, he's a gentleman. Don? Uh, yeah, cool, cool, calm customer, sensible. Uh, Tomo, Helen Glover. Helen Glover, ferocious competitor, fabulous person. Don? Um, yeah, a pocket rocket. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm not going to ask you to elaborate. Uh, Tomo, Heather Stanning. Major Stanning. She Heather. is cool, calm, and collected. Okay, Triple C. Don? Must have values. He's in the military. <laughs> okay, here's an interesting one, Tomo. Your former teammate, Mike Mackay. Ah, uh, Mike. <laughs> okay. Look, Mike is passion, passion, passion. Okay, many Ps. Don? Uh, tough competitor. Hates losing. Very much so. Anna Watkins, Tomo? Anna? Anna is one of the smartest athletes I've coached and the, the most talented athlete I've coached. Physically, she, she, or well, mentally, she, she is the, the real deal. Don? She made Catherine Granger. <laughs> and on that note, Don, Catherine Granger. Uh, Dame Catherine Granger, legend of the sport over many, many years. Great competitor. Tomo? Uh, she's just all round fabulous, good good guy, good girl, athlete. She, she's just an amazing individual. Right. James Tompkins. Quality training athlete. Tomo? Yeah, he's a competitor in a quiet way. Yes. Great yes. sense of humour. Tomo, Drew Ginn. Drew Ginn? Uh, I've always recalled Drew being a cheeky bugger. Uh, athletically gifted and used it brilliantly. And Tomo, Kate Allen, Kate Slater. Yeah, oh, look, Kate's fabulous. Um, she lives 750 metres away from me uh, from me here, believe it or not. So uh, we've followed each other around the globe. Look, uh, Kate is a competitor through through and through and through. She's a champion in a whole host of sports and in life. Well, Uncompromising uh, and backs herself in to perform. All right. And Don, I'll stay with you. Megan Marks or Megan Still? Uh, perfect foil for Kate Slater. <laughs> so, uh, look, Megan is dedicated, uh, dedicated athlete, and um, she did everything that was ever asked of her and more. Definitely. All right, and the last one, gentlemen, the two Roberts, Robert Walker and Robert Yarling. Don, I'll start with you on this one. <laughs> uh, wonderful human being. Uh, Robert Yarling. He lived with me for a while. Wonderful human being. Robert Walker? Uh, much the same in a different way. Um, got the most out of himself. Wasn't super talented, but competed at a very high level it's out of desire. And Tomo, what's your perception of those two blokes? Funny larrikins. <laughs> Yeah, Rob, Rob Walker, they are Americans. Uh, yeah, look, Rob Walker, he, he is a great, a great guy and he did get as much out of himself as, as possible. He, he is a fabulous competitor. And uh, Rob Yarling, yeah, look, he's, he's a fabulous guy. He is funny too. Uh, great, sense of, great sense of humour and, um, you know, a, 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 crew, a crew maker. Right. Look, gentlemen, it's been a lengthy interview, but um, again, you both were so inspiring with the great stories that you shared. I mean, many, many gold, almost 10 Olympic gold medals. We could go longer on behalf of my Sunday Learnings team and myself. Thank you so much for sharing this. Will Rowing and aspiring Olympians would love to hear this content. And I'm sure this content will make them dance as long as possible. Not the last dance, but dance forever until Olympic gold is around their neck. And they're just going to keep on trying. And hopefully this interview will inspire them. Thank you so much. You two be safe and hope to see you on the sideline with a megaphone. And don't forget to wear your mask. Thanks, lads. You take care. Thanks.